Testing. Good evening, everyone. We thank you for coming to the Focus 10th Anniversary Celebration. Our lecture series starts tonight. We're going to get ready to get started, so we ask that everyone please find their seats. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone, including my grandson, who is down here in the front row waving to me. <laughs> With that, I'm Irvin D. Reed, former president of Wayne State University and the director of the Forum on Contemporary Issues in Society. This year we are celebrating the beginning of, uh, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary of this program where we have brought national and international speakers to the campus uh, for discussions on issues of importance to all of us. Um, in something of a departure, this year we have captured a title that will cover all of the programs that we'll be doing this year, including the first three uh, this fall uh, and winter. And then later on, we will have announced the programs for early 2018. The topic that we are using to cover all of these programs is, what in the world is going on? <laughs> um, as you see, as we start with our first three programs tonight, immigration. Um, next month, we're doing a program on the press and the presidency. And then uh, in November, we're doing one on uh, race in America. So you can see how it is appropriate that we use the topic, what in the world is going on. Um, when I first thought of doing something for the campus as a whole, I asked a group of faculty and staff to come up with some ideas. And what they came up with was a, a lecture series. And that lecture series is um, one that we started with Robert F. Kennedy uh, Jr. And we then went on and started and followed it with uh, Vicente Fox in September, almost precisely September 12th of uh, 2008. Um, President Fox has agreed to come back and be our lead-off speaker this year at the beginning of the 10th anniversary. At that time, I didn't tell the group of faculty and staff that I'd planned to step down as president of the university and I was looking for my next job, um, but they did come up with this idea and I was delighted. I told only two people I was going to step down as president. Uh, one was obviously my wife. Um, the other was chairman of the board at the time, Eugene Dreiker, who was here with us this evening. And um, the other person I told was um, uh, Eugene Applebaum of the Applebaum Family Foundation. And he said, well, what would you like to do? And I told him about this program. And he said, well, I will support you and the university in bringing this kind of discussion. So I would like you to join me in giving a round of applause to the Applebaum Family Foundation. <laughs> Before I introduce our main speaker of this evening, um, I would like to invite uh, Sandra O'Brien to come to the podium to bring um, greetings on behalf of the entire uh, university. Um, Sandy O'Brien is the uh, chairman of the Board of Governors here at university, the first Latina to be elected to the Wayne State Board of Governors. Since taking office, she has fought and helped implement tuition equity policy for undocumented Michigan students, worked to improve admissions standards to achieve more representative student, and successfully worked to hire M. Roy Wilson, our university president, who would be fully committed to diversity at Wayne State's historic uh, urban university. So I could tell you a lot more about Sandy, but we really want to get to uh, President Fox. So I would just like to ask you to join me in welcoming the chairman of the Board of Governor Sandy O'Brien. Sandy? Good evening, everyone, and bienvenidos. Um, thank you. On behalf of the Board of Governors, President M. Roy Wilson, our faculty, staff, and students, I'd like to welcome you to Wayne State University and the first program in FOCUS's 10th anniversary lecture series. I'd like to also extend an especially warm welcome to tonight's special guest, President Vicente Fox. 
and his wife Marta, who is also with us this evening. The Forum on Contemporary Issues in Society has a long and distinguished career at Wayne State. The university has a long and distinguished history at Wayne State, sorry. The, the university has been a, a proud to host the series, not the least because Focus embodies one of Wayne State's primary missions, which is to encourage dialogue on issues relevant to both the institution and the many communities it serves. As a major research university with local, national, and international outreach, Wayne State also shares Focus's serious commitment to diversity, both in our faculty and our student body. This semester, students from more than 80 countries are attending Wayne State. The life of any great university is based on providing an environment for free expression and open debate, qualities that should characterize our interaction with the broader community. The Forum on Contemporary Issues in Society fulfills this goal in extraordinary ways. And I salute Dr. Reed, his staff, and the many guests he has welcomed during Focus's debate of bringing dialogue, information, and inspiration to us all. I'd like to take a moment to introduce some of my colleagues from the Board of Governors who have joined us this evening. I ask that they stand and be recognized when I say their name. Governor Kim Trent. <laughs> Governor Michael Basuito. Governor Mark Gaffney. And I am pleased to announce that we have two Governor Emeriti with us this evening. Our former colleagues, Governor Emeritus Jacqueline Washington and Governor Emeritus Eugene Dreiker. I'm pleased to be a part of tonight's special event and wish each of you a very memorable evening. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Governor O'Brien. Even as school children, Americans are taught that we are a nation of immigrants. Many thousands of years, people migrated from Asia across a land bridge into North America. All of us have studied the early migrations of the English, the French, the Spanish to this continent. In the 19th century, most migrants still came from Europe, though they were joined in the West by the Chinese. We have all seen the old photos of signs saying, no dogs or Irish, but the Irish still voluntarily came. So did the Italians, the Spanish, as well as many others. But immigration was not always voluntary. A significant part of the history of this nation was the forced immigration of thousands of Africans who came unwillingly as slaves. In this century, immigration from Mexico, Central America, China, and India has been strong and consistent. And the future is clear. According to the Pew Research Center, foreign-born Americans and their descendants will be the central force in U.S. population growth and change over the next 50 years. Certainly, we are indeed a nation of immigrants. In the words of President Bill Clinton, America has constantly drawn strength and spirit from wave after wave of immigrants. They have proved to be the most restless, the most adventurous, the most innovative, and the most adventurous and the most productive. From the earliest stages of his campaign for the Republican nomination for president, Donald Trump spoke loudly and at length about immigration and immigrants. His concerns included people of Muslim descent and from Muslim countries, but most specifically and callously, he referred to immigrants from Mexico. He promised that if he were elected, we would build a, he would build a grand wall on the Mexican border, and Mexico would pay for it. 
It didn't take long for Mexico to react, and one of the strongest voices raised was that of tonight's guest, former President Vicente Fox. President Fox declared very plainly that Mexico wasn't going to pay for the wall. He also said some other things that you may have seen on YouTube. <laughs> or Or, or read on Twitter, but I'll leave that to your own research to find out specifically if you know some. As it turned out, his words were, not, uh, were broadcast around the world. They were prophetic, for even now the U.S. Congress is attempting to discover pal palatable ways that the president's wall can be paid for by American taxpayers. The latest news on the immigration front has been the announced phasing out of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. This program, created by executive order in 2012 by President Obama, allows U.S. residents who enter the country without documents as children to be given work permits and, to re and, and a reprieve from, from deportation. These dreamers, as they were called, are not eligible for welfare. They have to pay taxes and have no clear path to citizenship, even if they serve in the military, as many have. DACA affects some 800,000 residents. More than 90% of them actually work. <clears throat> the President <clears throat> put Attorney General Jeff Sessions in charge of DACA, not surprisingly, given his long opposition to the program, the Attorney General pronounced DACA as unconstitutional and claimed that it had denied jobs to hundreds of thousands of Americans by allowing those jobs to go to undocumented workers. Gene Epstein demonstrated with mathematical precision, precision in Barron's last week, this is simply not true. <clears throat> Dreamers are here and they are a part of all of us. To quote William Finnegan, writing in The New Yorker, many have no memory of the countries in which they were born. They are, in a word, Americans. But six months from now, and possibly sooner, they will begin losing their work permits, their places in colleges and universities, their businesses, their legal right in this country. They will start living in fear of deportation. The cruelty is staggering. Tonight's guest mints no words in his own reaction to this issue, calling the end of DACA cruel and heartless. His candor was not unexpected. Vicente Fox has been many things, a farmer, a bootmaker, truck driver, activist, the leader of Coca-Cola in Mexico and Latin America, a congressman, governor, and president. But one thing he has not been is bashful. Vicente Fox was elected Mexico's 62nd president in July 2000, ending 71 years of uninterrupted rule by the Institutional Revolutionary Party. As president, he sought to reduce corruption in government, improve relations with the United States, overhaul Mexico's law enforcement system, and resolve the causes of civil unrest in poorer provinces. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have him as our guest again this evening. I would like you to please join me in welcoming the former president of Mexico and citizen of the world, His Excellency Vicente Fox. Muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias. ¿Quién habla inglés aquí? ¿Quién habla español? Les presento a la señora Marta. Bueno, 
I hope we're going to have a great time here. Thanks to Dr. Arvin. Thanks to Sandra. And thanks to you for being here. Because you're inspiring. You are a joyful audience, always with hope, always with a smile, always leaders. That's why being here at Wayne State is so important to me. I thank God that Dr. Arbin found me still alive after 10 years <laughs> because I'm 75 now. And I can tell you that life has been great for Martha, for me, for our love, for our objectives, and for our commitment with others. Being for others is the shortcut to happiness. And this is what compassionate leaders know about. Compassionate leaders that transcend in history. Other leaders that don't have that characteristics, they might show up very intensely for a period of time, but if they don't have a good cause, if they don't think about others, if they don't think about your neighbors, they don't think about your nation, they don't transcend. They make a lot of noise. Leaders like Chavez or Maduro in Venezuela, but they will not transcend. On the contrary, they have destroyed the nation because populism, demagoguery, does not bring any good things to a nation. But anyway, we're here to speak and I'll try to meet the challenge of uh, speaking about migration. Difficult issue, but it's a common, all humane issue. At the very end, we are all here in this nation come from migrant families, except we find here a Native American. The rest of us are migrants. I'm a migrant myself. My grandfather came from Cincinnati, Ohio, without a penny in his pocket. He rode down to Mexico looking for his American dream, and he found it there. We've been there for five generations. And further behind, the family came from Strasbourg and way, way back from Ireland. And why? Because when there is peace, disease, unemployment, lack of opportunities, when there is war, people move out. But also we move out when we're looking for a better life when we're looking for bringing to our families a better life. And this is the story of the world. At the very beginning, millions of years ago, there were hunters and gatherers. The U.S. would move, getting a rabbit here, getting a carrot or a fruit somewhere else. And later, they learn to live in communities and farm. Farming was discovered way, way after hunters and gatherers. And learning to plant a seed and getting a product out of a harvest got communities moving. And for the first time, we learned to trade. Because we learn to produce more than what we needed 
and then we look for somebody that could, could use our excess product. And we settled down in communities, and we built empires, kingdoms, nations today. We have over 200 nations around the world. And everything, every day ahead, has been progress. It's been progress by hard working, by dreaming, by committing, by looking for better things. And so, the world came to see these migrant populations build cities, build empires, and build communities. The story between Mexico and the United States is not different. Over 200 years ago, we both went for independence. And when President Washington was riding the horse here, fighting for independence, Padre Hidalgo was doing the same on a horse, fighting for independence of Mexico from Spain. And later on, we made revolutions. And we brought in constitutions, and we brought in rule of law, and we brought in a definition of how we wanted to live and what principles and values would be of us to share. And that's the story of our relationship. We have gone through wars. We were invaded by the U.S. Army went down all the way to Veracruz. Pancho Villa, our great warrior, invaded a small community in Texas, was thrown back. So we went through a lot of conflicts, and we were perseverant. We were trying to build up a relationship because we're neighbors. We just happened to be neighbors. And then we became what we are. Today I can tell you that we're very proud to be Mexicans, that we're very proud of our heritage, that we are proud of our ancient cultures, millennial cultures. We're proud of the Mexico we have today. It's not one of the wealthiest nations, but we're doing well. We're on the mid of the table in relation to income and per capita. We have become a very strong competitive manufacturing nation. We're the 11th largest nation in the world. We are the most competitive place to manufacture today, and not because of our low wages labor, but because of our productivity, because we learn how to compete, because we're going to schools and universities to prepare ourselves to have the talent. And today, a lot of investment that has gone to China is back to Mexico. Today, Mexico has the manufacturing cluster, most productive, most competitive worldwide. So we, our plan is not to take away jobs from this nation. On the contrary, is to be a solid partner of this nation. And this is where NAFTA comes to being. The NAFTA dream was, let's get together, let's build a future together, Canada, United States, and Mexico. Let's level off our differences and gaps in income. Let's try to be the leading place in the world, the largest consumer market in the world, and as I said, the most competitive place. And we've done our part. We are not the little guy on the backyard. 
We are a very strong consumer market. We buy from United States over half a trillion US dollars every year. That means millions and millions of jobs, direct jobs for US citizens. Our trade balance is even. We buy what we sell. United States sells what it buys. So it's a great trade balance, the largest in the world. And trading is a win-win situation. It's not true that one side wins and the other one loses. It's not a zero sum, this trade balance. We buy what we need from United States. We don't care about the price of a Coca-Cola. If we like it, we buy it. We don't care about the price of a GM car. If we like it, we buy it in Mexico. So we buy plenty of goods, plenty of products, and plenty of services from this nation. It's a great, productive, relationship. What Mexico has won with NAFTA? I can tell you. Jobs, of course. Number two, to narrow the gap on income between what you make in the United States and what we make in Mexico. So if we take, for instance, just a $1 equivalent, the income you make in Mexico, if you learn how to swim or jump a wall, you make $10 instead of one. So you, you see it's a very strong incentive for people to come here. That's the price of success. Africa crosses the Mediterranean Sea to get to Europe, but the same deal. One to ten. You don't have that between Canada and United States. It is a one to one. So Canadians are happy with being on their own land, having their own food, living their own culture. They don't have to cross to United States looking for improving the income. So we do have that. It's a very powerful incentive, who would not do that? If you could, as an American, cross to Canada and make 10 times what you're making here in Detroit, maybe you will take the chance. Now, let me say here, I'm not for open borders. Every country has the right to establish its rules to build its walls if you want to, but you don't ask your neighbor to pay for it. <laughs> About walls, this huge, beautiful, big, long Chinese wall that the one being built here is going to be better. <laughs> well, the Chinese government and the Chinese people wasted their money. Today, that wall is bringing tourism, which brings some income. But at the time, that wall served no purpose at all. It was built to prevent the enemies of China to come in and conquer China. The Mongols, the Manchus, and what happened? They crossed the wall with their horses, they got into China and they conquered China, the Mongols and the Manchus. And then Gorbachev comes with another great idea, let's build a wall in Berlin. <laughs> and they built a wall preventing Germans 
Russians and East Europeans to get out of Germany, to get out of Berlin. And that wall failed because it had no purpose, because it was against a value which is freedom. And so here comes this great U.S. President Reagan and says, cloud, loud and clear, Mr. Gorbachev, tear off that wall. And that wall was teared off. So, if this guy wants to build a wall here, good. Let him do it. He's going to ask you, each one of you, for 35 billion U.S. dollars to build the wall. Do you know what you can do with 35 billion? <laughs> you can eradicate hunger for two years in the whole of the earth. <laughs> you can contract you can contract 200,000 teachers to educate. <laughs> so there are much better options than building a wall. And I tell you one, that President Bush, his administration, and my administration dedicated a lot of time of putting together a migration law, a bill that would go to Congress. And we invested time, money. And that bill was presented to U.S. Congress by Senator Kennedy and Senator McCain. And it's a great solution to the problem of migration. Number one, we have to stop it. It cannot just keep on growing and expanding. There is a limit to the people you need and the people you can accept in your nation. That is true in Europe. That is true here. So there are three key issues on that bill presented. Number one, what do we do with 11 so-called undocumented, 11 million that are supposed to be here in the United States. Nobody knows how many they are. Nobody knows where they are. But it's said that they are 11 million. The answer on that bill presented is, OK, let's first of all identify, let's ask him, and let's prepare a list of who these 11 million are ask him to subscribe, and then find out if they, are, they have a job, if they are working for you, if they're working for President Bush's family, like I saw he had a couple of them there. <laughs> if they're working for McDonald's or for Walmart or for the construction industry, let them stay as long as they have that job as long as that company or that family wants to keep them. If they don't, then they go back to Mexico. And we, Mexican government, were in total agreement. Yes, I will catch back all those that come because they are not occupied here. They don't have a reason to be here. Number two, this economy, U.S. economy, when it grows at a pace of 2.5%, its gross domestic product, it needs to import half a million workers to comply with the needs. So every year up to now, there's about half a million that are imported, documented, and coming to work here. So let's keep doing that because it's good for not only Mexico, it's from many other nations, Hindus, Africans, Europeans, or whatever. So that's the second point it has. So the moment the economy grows faster, you increase the amount of people as temporary workers. As soon as the economy slows down, then you reduce the amount of people coming in. And thirdly, the third point was 
any person that is eligible, either on the point number one or point number two, has the right to bring his family as long as he is here. It's criminal to separate families. It's criminal to send the kids back to Mexico and the parents to stay in here. Is yet Okay, so that's, that's the basis of what we can do. Why to use the stick? Why to build a wall? If we can sit down and speak about our problems. We're partners, as I said, in NAFTA. And NAFTA has a long way to go yet, producing for both of our economies great results. I mentioned the reason for Mexico to benefit in NAFTA. Let me tell you now, United States. Just one. One thing. Not more than five years ago, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford Motor Company went broke. They went broke because they couldn't compete. Not because of Mexico. They couldn't compete. Cars manufactured in the United States were much higher priced than the Mercedes, the Toyotas, the Nissans, the Mazdas. So foreigners were conquering the U.S. market. And the three companies went broke. How they came back to life and to the marketplace? Because of you, taxpayers, you saved them. There was billions and billions of dollars that government took to rescue these three corporations. And what else they did to be competitive? They became NAFTA corporations. This means today they nourish from the competitiveness of each of the three economies. So they do basic manufacturing in Mexico. They do some more sophisticated manufacturing in Canada. And finally, do the, the cream, the top of the business. They do it here in the States. And they keep generating jobs. So now they're back to life. Now they're growing. Now they're expanding. Now they are selling cars everywhere else in the world. By the way, all cars manufactured in Mexico have 40% content that is imported from the United States. So it's, it's like Trump does with his business, with his ties, <laughs> with his caps. He buys in China. And this takes me back to that great virtuous act of trading. When you are buying a McDonald's hamburger here, you are bringing thousands of people to work for you. Some that produce the meat, that raise the cattle, that raise the food to keep the cows growing. Some that produce the packaging. Some that produce the soft drinks and the Coca-Colas. So a lot of people works for you anytime you buy something. And that's the way to see it. You have a lot of people from here and from elsewhere working for you. And when you produce something and you sell it, you are working for others, bringing in goods and services that you know how to manufacture. So that's trading, and that's a, the win-win situation. So who wants a trade war? In economy, every action has a reaction. If you say, to protect my jobs, I'm going to tax automobiles coming from Mexico. We can sell them somewhere else. But you that are going to buy that GM car here, or that Toyota car, or that Nissan car here, you're going to pay 30% more for that car. Is it fair that that decision affects you so much? You win and lose, you win and lose, but it's proven that by working together, 
by being NAFTA, Canada, Mexico, and United States, we are the strongest economic region in the world. We are the largest consumer market in the world, and we can lead the world. Because what is the option? If this great nation renounces to its leadership, decides to build the wall, decides to isolate from the rest of the world, decide not to participate in TPP. This is the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement that is being built, all the rest of us together. There we are, China, Mexico, Russia, Brazil, Argentina, uh, and other nations working a deal to trade among ourselves. And the United States said, I'm not participating. Play that game yourself. I don't care. So what's happening today? We already are dealing with China where to buy many products that for the moment we buy here. This is our B plan in Mexico. When I say every action has a reaction, that's what is happening already. And we're already going down south to Argentina, to Brazil, to buy the grain that we need. Do you know how much corn, wheat, sorghum, Mexico imports from United States? It's well over 30 billion US dollars worth. And we're gonna buy it in Argentina now. We're gonna buy it in Brazil. By the way, at a lower price. Do you know how much milk, dairy, cheese we buy from the United States? So farmers are going to be harmed here. Every action has a reaction. So we have to evaluate the decisions we want to take before we tweet them. <laughs> And, uh, so, I come back to the concept. NAFTA was created with the purpose of making the three of us stronger, helping the guy back there in Mexico. And so, we also thought about how can we improve it? And this happened in my own administration and with President Bush administration. Since then, we said maybe NAFTA can be improved. And when that very sad, horrible day of September 11th came about, immediately security became the issue. And immediately we thought we need a NAFTA that includes all security aspects. And that's what we made a huge file this size on what we call NAFTA Plus Trade and Security to improve NAFTA, the original NAFTA. And it is there also sitting in Congress. And today, yes, other things can be added to still make this trade agreement, this partnership that, he, that we have, better than what we have today. But again, you sit down on a table, you see eye to eye, you see face to face, and say, okay, what bothers you? No, oh, it bothers me that you have a surplus, and I'm a winner. I cannot accept that you have a surplus with the United States economy. Do you know that as well as there is a surplus between Mexico and United States on the side of Mexico, every single economy in the world has a surplus in front of U.S. economy. The business of this economy is not to have surpluses on trading. It is to have open doors for investing, for producing Coca-Colas in Mexico by the millions by producing computers and selling in the Mexican market by the millions. 
by profiting, selling products all over the world and bring the profits back here to the United States. So the business is different between the U.S. economy and other economies. Just let's take India, the master on information technology service, the master on call centers, the master on processing accounts, accountability, no, accountability, no. Contabilidad, como se dice? <laughs> Account. Processing, processing <laughs> profit and loss and, and statements. Many, not to say all medium-sized corporations in America, they send online their information, they process it in India, and it comes back. So you're outsourcing that activity, and that brings to India millions and millions of jobs. Somebody could claim, why are we giving so much jobs to India? Because it's convenient, because it's good for both. And that's the way the economy works. So NAFTA purpose then is being met, as I said. And it has a lot more to give to us. Now let's have a word again on migration. It's a difficult issue. I'm not for open borders. Not. I'm not. We have to regulate. We have to bring order. And we have to accept as much as we can, and it's convenient for this nation. In Mexico, still, you run around the countryside, and you hear these campesinos that were invited and brought here back 50, 60 years ago uh, as braceros to supply jobs and labor because U.S. citizens were fighting a war in Europe. Two million Mexicans came here and worked here for three, four years and worked here just for a minimum wage, no French benefits. So they were invited. You had them here. They did the job together with the women and the ladies that are working in factories while the men were fighting the war. Two million Mexicans were here. Nobody said thanks. Nobody sir, said, I owe you your French benefits, your social security. They are back there still claiming if they would get something. But anyway, that's when compassion becomes a part of political activities, of government decisions. It's so important to have compassion when you're running a nation. It's not like running a business. This guy has a long way to go to understand the difference, and I went through that. I went through that. I was a congressman for three years, and I learned a little bit the different game I was playing as a politician and not as a businessman. And all my pride of having been the CEO and president of the Coca-Cola company, when I was in politics, I had to be humble. I had to open my eyes, my ears, and learn, and learn. And it took me then being governor four years, and yet, a learning process. Even when I was president, the first two years, I still was out of fashion, out of harmony with the political doing. It's, it's, it's totally different world. You don't go through executive orders. That you do in business. You instruct and you fire he who doesn't follow the instruction. That doesn't happen in politics. It's totally different. So, I hope things will come much better to the future. And now let's take a look at that future. That future is bright. We're going to have an exciting 21st century. Really exciting. So many things are going to happen that every day we will see new things. 
And every day we have to adapt. So today, going to university, even if it's the best Wayne State University, if you just think that with those five years you made it for life, you're wrong. You are wrong. If today you think that you get a job with those five years, you start a job and that you're going to be there for life working for GM, wrong thinking. That will not happen. Manufacturing jobs are flying away anyway because of robotics, of technology, because yes, some of them are going to other countries. But today, we have to go to school every day of our life. We have to be attend to learn what's coming, what's happening, what's going on. And uh, so that's what we have ahead on education. And what about jobs? I mean, we're moving at fast the speed towards a world without jobs. That's coming. Three, five years from now, 10, 20, no more. And what are we going to do? Robots are going to be doing, are going to be doing what we do today. So let's look at it the positive way. They're going to be working for us. They're going to be taking my job. But nations like Sweden, like Norway, already are doing something about that. So they already approved universal income, universal pension to all families in the country. So that you're safe, so that you have a safety net, so you have income. And then you can dedicate to something else, maybe to culture, maybe to science, maybe to go back to school, maybe to run around the world that is so beautiful and so many exciting places to visit. But that's coming, and we have to solve it. First jobs that went from the United States to Mexico were textile and apparel. Denim jeans manufacturing moved out of here, of the Carolinas, and went down to Mexico. We don't have them anymore. Now they are in Central America, and now they are being manufactured somewhere else. That's going to happen with the automobile industry because of so many reasons. Even Mexico will start losing those jobs that we have temporarily there. So we have to think about the next sector of the economy, the next areas of growth. That's why you cannot sit down in front of the TV, get a glass of beer, and wait until Trump brings back your job. You're not going to get it. You are not going to get it. And tell you why, tell you why. Because that's the story of Latin America in the 20th century. We had dictators all over. We had authoritarian governments. We had prophets. We had demagogues. We had populism. And we had the Kirchners, and we had the Perons, and we had the big generals uh, being presidents, destroying nations. And we all believe the promise that they gave to us. You have fear? Don't worry. I build a wall for you. You have fear? Don't worry. I shoot some atomic bombs to North Korea. You feel fear because you don't see where you can get a job or get income? Don't worry. I will bring back the carbon jobs. I will bring back the jobs that Mexico took away from us. Wait, sitting on your chair. That's what we live throughout the 20th century. When you don't believe and are convinced that you go as far as you work, as far as you go to school, as far as you have dreams, purpose, and objectives, it's not the president that's going to come to solve your problems. You can take the example of drugs. We all think that government is going to solve the problem we have with drugs with my sons. Do we really think that government is going to eradicate drugs from the face of the earth? 
Do we really think that we can put our children in hands of government because they're going to protect them of heroin, of uh, marijuana or something else? We cannot renounce our obligation as parents, as fathers, as mothers. We must... <laughs> we must be close to them. We must let them know it's very harmful if you take drugs. We must give them the right information. But at the very end, all of us, we were created free by God. The founding fathers of this nation said freedom is the most important value of this nation. So exercise your freedom, but have responsibility. Mexico is blamed for the violence we have there, the killings. And have you stopped to think why we have that? Some might think these Mexicans are drinking too much tequila. <laughs> They're killing each other now. What's happening there? What happens is that we are trying, we are trying to refrain the drug from coming to this nation. So in a way, we're working for you, for this nation. And then we hear, okay, I'm gonna give you five grand, 500 million. Keep it going, Mexicans. Keep stopping the drug coming from Colombia, from Venezuela, from uh, Bolivia, from Ecuador. And here we are obeying, trying to do that, and we're killing each other. We lost last year 80,000 kids that were born non-criminals. They did not have criminality on their genes, and still they died out on the street. Why? Because they couldn't get a scholarship to Mexican universities. Because they couldn't get a job in GM plant or somewhere else. So when you don't have options, they join the cartels, and the cartels are paying double than GM is paying on the manufacturing plant. We have a problem there, big problem. But what happens when these cargo loads of drugs cross the border? What happens? Where is the CIA? Where is the DEA? Where is all these agencies that are supposed to cut the transit of the drug. Do you know that this country is one of the few remaining that penalizes drug consumption? Drug consumption is not penalized in Mexico. Drug consumption is not penalized in most countries in Europe. Drug consumption is not penalized in South Latin America. What is penalized is production, distribution, selling, but not consumption. And this nation prohibits, impose, imposes penalization and jail to those that consume. So you have three and a half million people in jail. What for? President Nixon convoked to this war on drugs and cartels 50 years ago. And it grows and grows, consumption, criminality, homicides, keeps growing and growing. So we have a problem in Mexico, a big problem. We don't produce drugs significantly. Everybody would think that Mexico is a factory to produce drugs. We don't produce drugs significantly. They come from the South. We don't consume drugs significantly. I mean, our rate of consumption is one-tenth, maybe one percent of the per capita of consumption in this nation. And yet, we have the problem. We have to find an answer to that because it's killing us. It's killing our youth. It's killing our people. It's killing our economy. So we, we need to sit down as partners and say, okay, what do we do with drugs? Mexico will say reduce consumption in the States. Or better off, legalize. Legalize. 
so that we finish with this black on the ground market that by the way generates 55 billion US dollars a year that go directly in hands of cartels. Imagine their power. Imagine the ammunition, the guns they have. Imagine the money they have to pay their organizations and talent. Imagine the money they have to get Chapo Guzman out of jail in Mexico. They have a million they give to the jail keeper, a million, and to the other guy a million, and there goes Chapo, out. It's very difficult to compete with this power that we have down there. And please don't think about how we can help, maybe sending the army to Mexico. No, please. We don't want that. We don't want that. Like Trump suggested with Venezuela. I mean, we have so many cases in Latin America where U.S. interventions were not welcome and brought in a lot of reject to that behavior. But anyway, so that's, that's all. Let me, let me finish with the optimism, the 21st century. Do you know that we're going to end up with hunger on this 21st century? That we're already producing more food than all that we can consume, the 8 billion people that are in this land? And then we say, why there is poverty and hunger? Because we need a brilliant mind that <laughs> allocates all these products and food that we have around the world. But many times we have to throw it away to keep high prices in the market or other decisions. But anyway, we're going to end up with that. Number two, we are going to have those that are being born in the second part of this century they will have 130 years expectancy of life. And this is proven. And the trend is moving in that direction. We moved from 50 to 84 today in 30 years. And we will get to that point, those that are going to be born within the century. It's going to be boring. Imagine 130 years. <laughs> But that's why we're leaders, we have imagination, we can think about many, many things that we can do. And if we can do them for others, magnifico, splendid, that's a great thing. And also, the most important part is wars. It's predicted that we will not have wars. Tough wars, worldwide wars. And that's the key issue. It's the only one that might not respond to the forecast. So we need compassive leaders. We need love. We need understanding. We need to understand that there is little space for us, but there should be a little space for everybody else. And this nation is what taught us all along. You are very compassive. You're very love-oriented. You always think good things to do. Right now, somebody's moving us in a different direction. We must watch out because the philosophy, the beliefs, the principles of the founding fathers are so intense within each American citizen that they will prevail. And presidents come and go, four years. So, we, we have a reason to be optimistic. Our President Peña is bright in shadows. Good things he's done, but awful things he has missed to do, especially in relation to corruption, in relation to uh, drug cartels and violence. So we're also waiting for next year, we will have an election in Mexico, we hope there will be no surprises. <laughs> Como dicen, es mejor paso firme y corto que tratar de llegar primero. Vamos a...
hacer cosas bien. Bueno, time for questions and thank you for inviting me. Muchas gracias, doctor. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we obviously have had an intellectual tour, but also very pragmatic, and we have seen a humanitarian expression uh, and a passion that we, often, we don't often see here. Going even further, the President has agreed that he will have what will be even probably a better part of the evening, and that is the Q&A. Now, the last time he was here, he reminded me after about 10 or 15 minutes that, Mr. President, I'm hungry, so let's make sure that you keep your questions uh, very short and, and um, to the point. Please do not make speeches. There are microphones on both sides of the room. Um, and if you are going on too long, I'm not being rude. I will have to cut it short because the President is really hungry. <laughs> So, who is going to be first? We have a question. Come to the microphone on either side. Um, you can line up there, and if I don't get to all of you, I do apologize ahead of time. Please, on the left here. Jonathan. Um, Mr. President, thank you for coming to Detroit. My thought is DACA may or may not pass. Is there a way, especially with the university students, and the uh, professional students from Mexico where you can build almost a uh, exchange. Uh, and I'm not talking student exchange because I know a lot of kids go down to Mexico for, for that. But to build a professional economic trade is there, I think that would strengthen so that by the time they have to go back or want to go back, there's that piece already in place. Okay. Uh, quickly, uh, that should be part of the NAFTA plus. Mm -hmm. Education should be right there. The heart of NAFTA should be related to human talent, to technology, to education. Because there is only one way you can change a nation in one generation, and it's through education. So that's that should be included in NAFTA, this kind of thinking. Uh, tell you that in Mexico, only one out of three kids have today the opportunity to be in a university. Only one out of three. The other two don't have that opportunity. So we have to increase quickly those opportunities by bringing in universities, but also by going online education or other alternatives, but move Pastors. My thinking is maybe we need much more community colleges, much more professional technical education to provide talent and energy to the job market and to the activities of the economy. Like Germany. Germany, they don't shoot for many uh, masters or doctors. They shoot for Technicians, professional technicians. But anyway, that's, that's part of what I, I see. We should consider that in NAFTA. That's what we should be discussing. Very good, thank you. We'll take one question from that side. I, I wonder if you might comment on the uh, Mayan influence that might uh, uh, be part of your spirituality. Detroit has got a long uh, history of murals down here, murals up here, the DIA has you know, great Mayan uh, uh, um, um, stuff in the collection. If you could just comment on whether or not that's influenced you. Specifically, the comment on what? On the, the, the Mayan culture of, of, of Mexico and Central America, whether that's had any influence on you. The culture? Yeah. Huh? The Mayan. The Mayan culture. <laughs> okay. Great culture behind. 
You know, our people here, maybe, this is the way I see it, would rather have more tacos and tortas than hot dogs and hamburgers. <laughs> so so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say that at the very end, not everybody wants to come here and stay here forever. Some want that, and they have to wait on the waiting line to become U.S. citizens. Others want to come and work for a year, for two years, make some money, transfer some money to their families, like a guest worker program. So there are several alternatives that we could work on to have options of how to manage this difficult issue. But, you know, the culture is being so mixed now that on the border, on the border states, it's difficult to see the difference between those that already are on this side, those that are still on the other side, and the huge exchange every day, kids coming to school here, kids or young people going to work in Mexico at the Maquiladora. This is a huge exchange, and so the culture is fusionando, say, it's, it's blending itself. Thank you. We'll take uh, Jonathan. One question on this side, please. Este, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Lidia Maciel y mi pregunta es, ¿qué le diría a los que están aquí en los Estados Unidos que son estudiantes de DACA que nunca han conocido a México? Uh, what would I say to DACA students that are here? Mm -hmm. uh, take it easy. Don't over worry yourselves. A solution and reason will prevail. I'm, I'm sure of that. It, it cannot happen in a different way. Uh, it's this learning process that I mentioned for this guy and to appreciate what he would be losing. As I said, Colin Powell, on a speech I heard from him, he said, minorities will soon be majorities in this country. And there's a huge myopia in not preparing that next generation. I wish we could get the 800,000 into Mexico. It's pure brain. It's pure human talent. It's already educated. I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we should take it and we should bid for it and bring in as much as we can. And other nations would love to do that. It's very costly to prepare somebody at university level, very costly. And it's something we should use, that great resource. But anyway, I, I don't think it will happen. I don't think it will happen. The checks and balances of this nation is not only in relation to the law or to whatever else. It also has to do with humanism, has to do with compassion in the right sense of the word. And as I said, it, it, will, it will not happen, uh, I'm sure. And if it happens, I will be here. And my grandma used to say, if you don't behave well at night, somebody will come and get your feet and pull your fingers of your feet. <laughs> that I will do to Trump. <laughs> Señor Presidente, el San Francisco Chronicle notó que usted dijo que marihuana debe de ser incluido en NAFTA. ¿Cree que esto pueda aliviar o terminar la guerra con los narcos? Uh, I don't remember that I related it to NAFTA, but it's a good idea. <laughs> like all farming product, if it becomes legal. I was invited to the World Summit in relation to marijuana in Oakland, uh, in the Bay. And I had an audience, not as large as this one, but let's make it half of this, 500 businessmen that now farm marijuana, that now process marijuana, that now they have this dispensaries where they sell and retail marijuana, where they have research and development of product 
improving marijuana, as we improved cigarettes, taking away the nicotine that was a harmful part of the cigarette. Now they're doing that with marijuana. Nobody has died of using marijuana, nobody in the world. So, and it has some health attributes. If it's legalized, then it becomes a business. And then, yes, because imagine what's going to happen now that California legalized. What's going to happen between San Diego and Tijuana? I mean, I mean people from the Mexican side will cross to the San Diego area to consume because in Mexico still is illegal. Or better off, Mexico, if it's legalized and open like it is in California, we can start setting businesses, we can start research centers, we can start trying new variety. Now, don't be scared. Again, drugs are harmful. And people and young people don't go crazy when you legalize. It happened in Holland. Every single drug is legal today. Nothing special happened. It did not increase consumption. Portugal legalized all drugs, and there is a significant reduction on youth consumption of drugs. Because many times you go to consume because it's prohibited. Prohibitions attract, uh, especially young guys. When it's open and it's free, it doesn't happen. It's not happening everywhere that has been legalized, like it's Washington State, Colorado. So it's, I think it's working now. Jumping to the other drugs. Many people get scared on that. I don't. I use the same principles. I use the same principle. Let's educate, let's inform, let's prevent with our kids. Let's be close to them. And I know we will lose some, but I know it will not happen a massive problem with legalizing. And imagine getting rid of cartels. 80,000 kids died in Mexico. Imagine getting those 55 billion and put them on the hands of government because there's heavy taxation on the business of, of uh, legal drugs. Thank you. We can only take two more questions because we're coming on the post for the time. So we'll take one from here. Jonathan? Muy buenas tardes, señor presidente. Soy su amigo Benjamín Esquivel, nuevamente saludándolo en los proyectos de Guanajuato. Mucho gusto. Mi pregunta para usted es, ¿cómo usted personalmente podría animar a otros mexicanos empresarios que hagan inversiones aquí en la ciudad de Detroit, especialmente en la comunidad latina? Yes. Sabemos Yes, Sa I can. Sabemos que su influencia lleva mucho peso. No, yes, I Gracias. can, and this is something that Matt and I work every visit we make. Uh, we were talking with the, with the doctor. Uh, what about if we bring a group of students for a week's time in summer in Guanajuato? That would be great. They, they will open their minds. Uh, we have culture there and everything. But we bring in trade missions. Right now there is one agreed with Denver. They're gonna come, about 25 businessmen from different sectors. And we're gonna have 25 Mexican businessmen on the other side. And it could be to develop business and invest here. It could be to do it the other way around. Yes, we do that. And if there is any authorities here in Detroit or the city of Detroit or the university, we can put that together uh, for next year. We can do that. We do big, big presentations at Central Fox with this delegation. They bring and show the products uh, and whatever they have. And it's very important to do that. Yes. Good. Okay, unfortunately, those of you who are standing, I really can only take one more question, and it will be from this side, and I apologize to all of the others of you who are standing. Mr. President, first of all, thank you for taking the time to see us tonight and speak with us. 
Um, I would like to ask you a question in regards to the controversies our country is facing right now. So right now there's a wide variety of ranging from DACA to the wall to immigration. Which one do you think is the most pressing and why? Espanol. <laughs> Can translate for me? Who translate for me the question? Or repeat the question, please, tell me. Um, More pressing. <laughs> eh? Más importante. For whom? <laughs> so more important to solve correctly. Yeah. To solve on the right way. Yes. All three of them. I mean, it's. Uh, I cannot repeat more and more, we are partners. We are a very important part of this nation. Just those 35 million Latinos or Mexicans that we have here, five generations, they're very important to this nation. We have in Mexico, there's no figures, but at least half a million U.S. citizens working in Mexico working in Mexico, working in Cancun, working in Mexico City. We have over a million living in these resort places, beautiful places like San Miguel de Allende. You know, when, when these things started to happen, people in San Miguel de Allende, there should be about 35,000 U.S. families there, living there and have a home. They came out to the streets to protest against what was going on here, and to ask or to present an apology to, to Mexico and to the people they live with in San Miguel de Allende. So we are so tight together, so blended, that it's difficult to separate. I, I'm, again, I'm an optimist, I'm a warrior, and I'm pressing to see if I can contribute with my modest thinking for things to change a little bit. And they will change. This country is strong because of its checks and balances. And that's appearing most every day. He takes one decision and then the reaction comes, either from a judge, either from Congress, either from somewhere else. And uh, so it has its safeguards, this great nation, which is those checks and balances. Ladies and gentlemen, again, let's thank President Fox for an excellent evening. He's been generous with his time. He's been generous with his willingness to come and help us celebrate this 10th anniversary. And what a way to get started. Let's give him another round of applause. Yeah, I did there. Gracias. Just let me remind you as you stand that we, have, we do have another program on October 24th on the press and the presidency with Steve Cortez, Joanne um, Reed, and Eugene Robinson. Place. It promises to be an excellent evening. And on November 16th, uh, we want you to come back to hear Michael Eric Dyson on race in America. Please have a good evening. Thank you so much. Hey, buddy. How are you? So I'm hungry. <laughs>